In the previous video, Dr. Tomlinson examined how teachers can use various forms of assessment to enhance their literacy instruction. In this video, Dr. Tomlinson will conclude her presentations with an examination of how each learner is unique and how student profiles can be used to mold instruction to fit readiness levels, learning preferences and personal interests. And now Dr. Tomlinson. Okay, so we've talked about the importance of community, mindset, connections, the importance of high quality curriculum to defensible differentiation, the importance of ongoing assessment to defensible differentiation. A lot of what the core of differentiation is, is now trying to say, well, so how do these kids vary in, in their readiness to learn this stuff? And what do they care about enough so I can bring them along with that and help them seek connections to their lives? And how can they learn best? So I want to show you a few examples of differentiating by readiness, interest, and learning profile, again, with a focus on literacy. Folks will often say, um, boy, that sounds like a lot. Do I have to do all these things? Can't I kind of just like do Howard Gardner and call it a day? And the answer is you can start anywhere that's comfortable for you to start. Some teachers are much more comfortable differentiating based on interest and some on learning profile. You can start anywhere. But when you're asking about research, here's what research tells us. It really doesn't matter if you know where kids are readiness-wise, and it really does not matter if you attend to those differences unless you'd like academic growth. And what we really know is that if work is not appropriate readiness-wise for kids, consistently. It's okay if something's a little too hard or a little too easy every once in a while. We're resilient. We live. But when work's constantly too hard or too easy, you don't grow. You just don't. So you've got to get around to this if academic growth matters. It doesn't really matter if we attend to kids' interests. A lot of teachers right now feel like we just don't have time to do that. No, nobody on the standardized test cares what they're interested in. And it really doesn't matter unless motivation is some issue for you and your students what kids are interested in, they will attend to and will stick with. And if they see no connections, there are a significant number of kids who won't go anywhere with you. So if you'd like motivated learners, investing in their interest is a big deal. And it really doesn't matter if you mess with all this learning profile stuff, unless efficiency of learning is ever a concern, meaning if you feel like you've got too much to do in too little time, this makes it more efficient. Kids learn it faster, and so it supports learning. A lot of research on this over many, many years. I want to share with you for some high school students of uh, benefits especially, a system that a teacher in Arizona has used, and I'm sure many other teachers do as well, to um, keep track of 150 kids with readiness and interest and learning profile. That's hard enough for an elementary teacher maybe only has 25 or 30 students, but of course they got five subject areas and so that multiplies their work. High school and middle school is just so daggone many kids coming in. So what Nancy does is create an index card, a five by seven index card for each kid. And on the front of the card, she just puts the kid's name and the class period that the student's in. She also color codes them, so like first period might have a pink card and second period orange and third period blue, so if she gets them messed up, she knows where to put them back quickly. And then on the back, she just has this little record keeping system. And what she's looking for here is as she observes this kid, is it a child who appears to be three years above grade level in reading, two years above, one above, sort of on grade level, little below, way below, just trying to get a handle on how's this kid with my textbooks? Can she comprehend what she's reading on the web? Here, how's the kid's school affiliation? Is this a kid who really likes school, feels successful in school, or is this a kid with kind of a negative affiliation, feels abandoned, angry, turned off, alienated, marginalized? And as she gets clues on these things, she just marks them on here. This is, um, is there any special population designation? 
it, it, does the student have a designation as a student with a learning disability, or free and reduced lunch, or English language learning, or learning disability, or gifted and learning disabled, or whatever. What are the student's interests? And under this interest thing, she just jots down things when she hears kids talking to each other, or when they talk to her, or when they bring up illustrations in class. And then she can refer back to this, as she's a math teacher, by the way, as she tries to create examples for students and show them applications of things. And this is her learning profile piece. And all she's done here is to choose five ways of thinking about learning profile. Unfortunately, there probably are 200 ways to think about learning profile. It's almost overwhelming because there's so many of them. And what she's just decided to do is I'll try to deal with about five sets. And if I can open up the classroom that much, it'll be better. And so again, as she sees, she doesn't, uh, um, I would personally not use a lot of surveys for this because I think kids are fluid in their learning profiles. I think they learn differently under different circumstances. But as she sees things, she just kind of marks down, is this a kid who does better with quiet, or is it a kid who needs some noise from time to time? There are kids who have to have some noise. <laughs> Dead silence just does them in, they can't think. And other kids who can't stand the noise. Is this a student who tends to be more verbal, more auditory, or more kinesthetic in their learning? Um, this is just her language. Is this a groupie or a soloist? Is a kid who likes to work with peers or is a kid who works alone? This was where we started the first day. It, with Sternberg, does the student gravitate toward analytical, practical, or creative task? And is this a kid who's a part-to-whole learner or a whole-to-part learner? That's a really important one that we can address pretty easily. School is all part to whole. We keep thinking if we teach kids little tidbits, they'll see the big picture. And for kids that do that, that's okay. But there's some kids, if we don't keep showing them the big picture, this is what it's about, this is how it fits, they're kind of sunk, and that's the one you need to look out for. So Nancy creates these over the years. She just keeps adding to them all year long. And she can take the cards and sort them and let kids work together based on similar or dissimilar learning profiles using these. She can form interest groups that way. Uh, she can look at this to see if there are kids in a class that need more advanced reading material or more basic reading material and so forth. And for her, this is a systematic way not to sink under the load of 150 kids, uh, but to really be a student of her students and gather the information. We know from the field of reading that readiness matters. Reading may be the first field that ever really used work like Vygotsky's in a big deal way in school. So literacy is really a trailblazer in the notion of readiness. Um, Richard Allington says, creating classroom environments in which successful reading is the norm for all children will mean creating classrooms in which children are well matched to the books that they read. One size fits all curriculum plans, expecting every child to read the same books, cannot produce a consistent pattern of successful reading. Classroom reform efforts must necessarily be targeted to ensuring that all children have books that they can read accurately, fluently, and with understanding. And that's true in first grade, and it's true in high school chemistry. Kids can't learn from materials that they simply cannot read. And they also don't grow from materials that are way too easy for them. So the readiness piece is, is a really big deal. Um, when kids read at an independent level, they can handle the thing just fine. They can sit down, read it on their own, and if they're concentrating, come away with something. When they're reading at a frustration level, even if they're trying, even if they're giving it their best shot, they're missing so many words that they can't bring the stuff together. Some experts in reading tell us that when kids miss as many as three words a page, they've lost the whole page because they've started having so many holes that they can't blend the stuff together. It'd be pretty scary to look at some of our fifth graders and seventh graders and ninth graders and see how many words a page they don't know the definitions of. Um, pretty important stuff. If you're frustrated, Reading at a frustration level, you don't grow. What matters is um, working at an instructional level where the stuff is too hard for the kids, but not so much that they can't reach it. You want them to have to stretch, and you want to help them stretch, and they need you to sit with them in small groups and give them models and give them scaffolding so they can stretch. 
but reading at an instructional level where the materials are a bit too hard and you have a support system is where growth comes. Um, Linda, who's um, incoming president of the Arkansas um, International Reading Association, was saying that she was at a conference the other day where they were talking about how important it is for that reach to be there. You don't want kids all the time just to read at an independent level. You really need to push them up that ladder a bit. But again, you don't put them on the top of the ladder and say, I hope you make it. You go up it with them and help them um, find the support. So let me show you a couple of examples here of some teachers dealing with readiness in literacy. This came from a teacher whose kids were reading um, a book and she watched them read, uh, not a whole book, but a piece, watched them read, and then she asked them to do something with it and they just flat couldn't do it. And she said to him, you know what guys, you're Teflon readers. I watched you and your eyes were moving on that page some of you had lips moving. I saw some of you following the print with your fingers, but you don't have any idea what you just read. You're like Teflon. When you read it, it just slides right off. And she said, you know what? It's kind of like when your parents are talking to you and your head's turned off and the words are just going. Pfft. What I'm going to have to get you to do is learn how to have a conversation with the book. So it's not just the book talking to you. It's you talking back to the book as well. And so one of the things that she began to ask them to do was to keep a double entry journal. It did not say basic at the top, that's just for you. It just said um, double entry journal and then it said as you read. And then on the overhead projector or the chalkboard she would write two or three of these things. Not all of them. <coughs> Because if you ask a kid to do all these things while they read, they'd go crazy. The stuff would be stoplight reading again. But as you read today, please write down what you think are the most important words and a summary of each section that you're doing. So asking them to produce that as they read. And over the year, she and the kids added things here, and she would vary what she asked them to do. You could also, by the way, have some kids do summaries and key parts and other kids do important <coughs> vocabulary depending on where their strengths and needs are. And then she said, after you read, and then she, after they read, she would give them a couple of these things. Again, not all, it's too many. But after you read, now how could you use the ideas? If you said you found an important idea, how's it important? What questions should this chapter raise for you or this article? What's the meaning of key words or passages? What would you predict is going to happen next in our science lab? Or what do you think is going to happen next in the story we're reading? What's your personal reaction here? What comments do you have on the style and so forth? And so again, over the year, she would ask them to do various things that expert readers do and to reflect on their reading. She found that their comprehension got much better, as did their awareness of reading. But she also found that she had a group of kids who were really good readers who could do this too easily. And so she developed a second form of it that looked like this. It did not say advanced at the top. It still just said double entry journal. My students would have reminded me that double is not three columns. <laughs> so I might have just called them multiple entry journals from that point on. But what she asked these kids to do again was as they read, to do a couple of these things. Now you'll notice that a couple of these like key passages and key vocabulary were on that first list. Sometimes it helps just to get that, especially if the material is complicated. But these other things are not things that you would ask um, readers who are less secure to do without a lot of help. What are the organizing concepts in this chapter? What are the key principles? What patterns are you seeing across the work that we're doing? What are links between text and graphics? And then she asked them, as they read, um, to explain these kinds of things. Why are the ideas important, which was on the first form, but how has the author developed the elements? How do the parts and whole relate? What assumptions are the author bringing here? And what are the essential questions that this chapter answers? And then she said, now talk about the chapter in another voice. So what would your teacher say about this chapter? Or you've just been reading a chapter on an ecosystem in science. What would um, 
Tom Sawyer say about that chapter? What would Gary Larson do with something like this? And it's causing them to look at different perspectives. What I really like about this, guys, is that she knew she had some kids who needed to learn to deal with, um, oh, I'm not gonna do that because it's too slow. Well, I did it anyway. Um, <laughs> To, to deal with sort of the fundamentals of good reading, but she didn't make kids who were already there just sit there. She's causing them to become better readers as well. So it's an example of using a strategy at two different levels of sophistication to push kids on. I'm gonna show you just one or two more of these. Um, this is a high school example that I thought was kind of an interesting. When I was in a history, um, department meeting one morning at a high school and a guy said to me, I don't know what these people think we're supposed to do in our classes now. We keep getting all these kids that aren't even speaking English and we're supposed to teach them and they haven't given us any textbooks in the kids' language and they can't read our textbooks and they can't take notes when I give them and I can't stop giving notes to go over to talk to them because if I do, the rest of the kids will go to heck in a handbasket. I don't know what they expect me to do. And foolishly, I said, so what did you do? And he said, I got them transferred out. Talk about a growth mindset and a positive environment. Kicked them out, they're too different, can't deal with them. So that afternoon, a colleague of his was saying the same thing to me, but in a voice that sounded a little mellower. And he said, you know, I, I'm really struggling. I think all of us are because we have a lot of English language learners and none of us have ever been taught how to teach them. And we see them struggling, but we don't know what to do to reach out. And I was scared to ask, but I said, did you try anything? And he said, you know, I did come up with one idea that seems to be helping. And I said, tell me what it is. And he said, well, I asked myself if I were that kid and I was in his country at 15 years old and every night people sent me home with all these chapters to read that are 20 and 25 pages long, how would I feel? And he said, you know, it occurred to me that even if I was motivated, I couldn't begin to read all that stuff overnight. There are not enough hours. It takes too long to translate. And so he said, I thought, you know, a thing that would help me would be if somebody were to take one of the books and highlight just the essential parts in a chapter, the parts that really tell the whole story in just a small space. So it might be the introduction and the conclusion, or it might be topic sentences in the paragraphs, might be key diagrams or pictures. And he said, I went through and I highlighted with the yellow highlighter just the parts that I thought a kid would have to read to understand. And I think he told me it was never more than about 15% of the chapter. And he said, I went to the kids one by one and I showed them the book and I said, you know, if I had to do homework in your country, in your language, I would get very tired because there's just too much. I think if you read the yellow parts, you can finish and you can understand. And he said you could just see the kids almost sigh because there was some hope. And I said, wow, does it seem to be working? And he said, it really is. They'll come get those highlighted books every time and work with them and they can finish it and it is encouraging. And I was feeling so much better compared to the morning and I said, I think it's really great that you thought of that. I had never heard of this before. It turns out it's a fairly standard special ed practice, but Anyhow, he invented it for himself and it was working fine. And I said, that's really terrific. And he said, but you know, a funny thing happened. And I said, tell me. He said, well, the kids from, that are learning English really like these books, but I have some kids with learning disabilities that come and get them now and they can finish them. And I've got some kids that just can't sit still, maybe ADHD, maybe just can't sit still. They'll come get the books and read the yellow stuff. And every once in a while, even some of my most able readers will read and then they'll come get the yellow stuff to see if they got the main ideas. He said, I think I'm up to marking maybe 16 books now. And by the way, he marked the first one and got kids to do the others for him. So it was not terribly time intensive. What do you think about that, guys? Um, two choices. They're inconvenient, I got them transferred out. Or they're inconvenient, I ignore them. Or here's something I can do to make it a little better. What do you think? Who are you going to vote for? <laughs> so he marked the chapter and found it useful for quite a number of students as he went. Okay, I'm going to switch for just one second here and flip over to show you one example of students' interest um, 
differentiation. It's a teacher who um, teaches primary kids and I think must have had a classroom that encouraged their inquisitiveness because things she was struggling with was every time they read or talked about anything, kids would say, where do birds sleep at night? How come butterflies get stuck to car windshields? And there were all these thousand questions. And you know, if you were in a Montessori setting, you'd say, well, let's go find that out. But this is a teacher who feels like she's got to march the kids toward that standardized test, but she didn't want to turn them off. So she created on a big wall, sort of a, a, a mobile. It, it kind of was a mobile, although it was attached to a wall, so it couldn't turn too much. But when the kids um, asked questions on topics that they were studying, the kids could actually write their question on various shapes of tag board and hang it up on the mobile and then either they or somebody else could find answers and put the answers on sticky paper on the back. So what you would have would be questions that kids were answering and then answers that kids posed on the back. And she found the kids loved doing that and they loved going to look at the mobile and it gave her a way to be able to say, what a great question, why don't you go put that on the insect mobile? Does that make sense to you? Instead of just answering it or saying, go look it up, she sort of gave them a mechanism. This is an example of interest-based differentiation at a high school level where a teacher is going to have the kids explore the concept of stereotypes in a, a, a Civil War unit in history. And what she wants the kids to understand is that anytime we start stereotyping people, we sell them short and we sell ourselves short. So the North stereotype the South, the South stereotype the North, Black stereotype Whites, White stereotype Blacks. And yet in every one of those groups, North, South, White, Black, Male, Female, there were heroes who really pushed us forward. And so what she's having the kids do is examine um, how real knowledge of people challenges stereotypes. But she's told the kids that they can do that, exploring these concepts uh, or these understandings in stories about the Civil War, art about the Civil War, music about the Civil War, journalism from that time period, or oral tradition. So by letting the kids choose the route that they're most interested in, they're all going to explore the same understandings in the same time period, but they can do it in a way that's more interesting to them. Going to do one more of these. I'm just determined to show you one from each one. This one I particularly want to do, and it'll be a good last one to show you, I think, because some of you have been in Sarah's workshops. Sarah Cager is here presenting for us, and she's written a number of things that are wonderful. One of my favorite ones is a book called Bringing the Outside In. And Sarah went into school kind of like most of us, just thinking you just sort of go in there and teach, and she got classes of kids who didn't just sort of want to learn. They were kids who were kind of turned off of school. Um, and so what she found was that by using a bunch of methods but where she excels is using the new technologies, the new literacies, to connect with kids. She really opened up the world of reading for them. And I want to share with you an example here, kind of. Um, she had a, a kid who came in and she asked the class to write their biography as a reader. What have your experiences been in school as a reader? How do you feel as a reader and a writer? What's been good for you? Where have the bumps been? And she had some kids who just flat refused to write. They were turned off by it. They weren't going to do it. They were angry. And so instead of punishing the kid or giving the kid a zero, she said, um, could you go home tonight and look on the web and find a picture that represents reading to you? And he didn't mind doing that so much. So he went home and came back the next day with a picture of a bulldozer and handed her the bulldozer and then wrote about the fact that um, reading tore things apart for him, that it plowed him under, that it always seemed intimidating, that it was destructive of his world in school, and that it was overwhelming. So he went from no response to using that picture to talk for him, but then bringing out some feelings. Um, over the year, the kids kept 
records of themselves as readers, their emotions, their feelings, their successes, their failures as readers, but they did it through icons that they collected off the internet. They did graphic storyboards where they would use their drawings or pictures that they got to tell the, to summarize, to critique the stories they were doing, and then they would use summaries. So again, starting with the picture, moving to the words. They used visual read-alouds and think-alouds where they told stories again with icons and with images rather than just with words. They did digital word walls. They um, used image cards to learn new vocabulary, but Sarah had them correspond with kids in another country, and the kids in the other country sent them images from their country that would represent these words, and the kids used those as flashcards for their reading. Uh, they did digital essays. They kept online logs a really lot with video images all the way through and um, had blogs and vlogs. And one of the coolest things they did was she and the, each, each student along with her kept their yearbook as a reader. So they had an online yearbook where she and the kid talked about what was happening to them as a reader, and the student again used images and video clips along with narration to keep track for the whole year of how they were evolving as readers. And I want to share with you a piece from a kid who would not read and would not write at the beginning of the year, who became this thoughtful because Sarah said, a book is one kind of literacy, but your world is full of literacies we don't even think about. And if you'll go to those, I can go with you. And so this kid said, I don't know what it is about this assignment, but I've never taken so much time to read something before. I think it's because I'm taking the time to let the picture unfold in my head. Part of me thinks I was tricked a little into this, <laughs> but in watching my video, I see myself as a reader. It isn't pretty, but it's there in ways that I don't see it if I just read through these notes. I don't know what's up with that, but I'm gonna keep coming so I can figure it out. It's the author's word working with my pictures and my words, and I understand in a completely different way. That's a really powerful statement. When you've got the author's words, and then I have to put pictures on it, and then I have to explain why those pictures make sense. We're working together with this book. It's not just the author anymore. What I think about reading is like the pencil sketch under a painting. What I hear and see when I read provides some of the layers. And I'm adding layers all the time when I think about something new or something happens that changes the me that's doing the reading. To me, this is real reading and I finally see what it looks like. This is a high school kid who could have easily left high school thinking I don't read and there's no place in it for me. But by using new literacies, new technologies, the stuff became his as well. I want to um, finish with you um, with one sort of thing that works pretty well with this little boy's comment, young man's comment. Charlie Brown and Linus are the kids we've been talking about these three days. Charlie has a little difficulty wrapping around things. That stupid football's been pulled out from under him 700 times and it's going to happen again next year. It's just hard for him to get the significances. On the other end of the spectrum, Linus always knows more than the teacher does and can always tell the teacher how to improve her lessons and what book would be better to use. Not that he's always appreciated, but he keeps doing it. And they're having a conversation about school. And Linus says, our teacher has an interesting theory. She says, teaching's like bowling. All you can do is roll that ball down the middle and hope you touch most of those students. And Charlie thinks about it and he says, whew, she must be a terrible bowler. And what's happening is we get more Charlies and Linuses along the gullies, and we keep bowling down the middle. We keep missing more and more of them. I'm sure you guys feel like you have brain sog because you've heard so much in three days, and it'll take a while for some of that to set in, and as is the case, some of it will leave you completely. Um, but I want to remind you just of one thing that's sort of like the guy talking about reading, adding layer after layer, which is kind of how we learn. What we've been talking about is owning student success, connecting with kids, studying kids, and creating a place where kids feel safe with you and with each other. And inside that wrapper, constantly working for meaning-based, enriched curriculum, 
assessing kids constantly to see where they are in relation to that. And then when you find out where they are, adjusting your instruction so that you can reach out to them in different ways. And on some level, that's very simple. And on some level, it's pretty complicated. So I want to give you a, um, a cartoon and then a thought. This, little, this is Gary Larson again, and I don't know if you can see this too well, but this is a dog on a tightrope, and he's riding a unicycle. He has a jug on his head. He's juggling balls. He's got a cat in his mouth, and there's a hula hoop around his waist. Does that sound like differentiation at all right here at the end of three days? And below him are a bunch of people watching. The students who might eat you alive, or your colleagues down the hall who might not like it if you teach this way, or somebody who doesn't understand why kids move in your classroom, why they don't in other places. And the caption says, high above the hush crowd, Rex tried to remain focused. Still, he couldn't shake one nagging thought. He was an old dog, and this was a new trick. <laughs> Anybody feeling that way at all? <laughs> um, here's how you do it, guys. This is a little book by Peter Reynolds, and it has to do with how your kids learn, and it has to do with how you and I learn sort of um, age-old story, and it's no different for the kids and for us. Art class was over, but Vashti sat glued to her chair. Her paper was empty. Vashti's teacher leaned over the blank paper. Ah, a polar bear in a snowstorm, she said. Very funny, said Vashti. I just can't draw. Her teacher smiled. Just make a mark and see where it takes you. Vashti grabbed a marker and gave the paper a good, strong jab. There. Her teacher picked up the paper and studied it carefully. Huh. She pushed the paper toward Vashti and quietly said, now sign it. Vashti thought for a moment, well, maybe I can't draw, but I can sign my name. The next week when Vashti walked into art class, she was surprised to see what was hanging above her teacher's desk. It was a little dot she had drawn, her dot, all framed in swirly gold. Huh, I can make a better dot than that. She opened her never-before-used set of watercolors and set to work. Vashti painted and painted a red dot, a purple dot, a yellow dot, a blue dot. The blue mixed with the yellow. She discovered she could make a green dot. Vashti kept experimenting, lots of little dots in many colors. If I can make little dots, I can make big dots too. Vashti splashed her colors with a bigger brush on bigger paper to make bigger dots. Vashti even made a dot by not painting a dot. At the school art show a few weeks later, Vashti's many dots made quite a splash. Vashti noticed a little boy gazing up at her. You're really a great artist. Wish I could draw, he said. Bet you can, said Vashti. Me? Nah, not me. I can't even draw a straight line with a ruler. Vashti smiled. She handed the boy a blank sheet of paper. Show me. The boy's pencil shook as he drew his line. Vashti stared at the boy's squiggle, and then she said, sign it. So if you will go make a dot and hang it up and make another dot and keep practicing with them, you will have an exhibit. And it will be an inspiration to you and to your students and to other people as well. I'll see a lot of you in a few minutes or at lunch, but thank you so much for your time, and I hope the rest of the day is great for you. Thank you.